that has breath, praise ye the Lord. Did anybody come to worship this morning? We all breathing in here, so that means we should see some hand clapping and some hand raising, some dancing. Let's worship, y'all. Let's go.
the giants Worship from the lions Sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain Louder in the valley Trusting that he's gonna get you there Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder Wait for the answer Worship with your hands in the air I'll praise you anywhere And in Numbers 13, it talks about how God has a conversation with Moses and he tells Moses to send a leader from each of the tribes into Canaan and kind of scope it out. So Moses tells the 12 leaders to go in and they come back with a report. And they all saw the beauty. They talk about the, the rivers flow with milk and honey. But 10 said, those giants are too big. They compared themselves to grasshoppers saying, we can't overtake them. They just flick us out of the way like we were nothing. But Caleb and Joshua, they saw the exact same thing but had a completely different perspective. And Caleb even said, we can take them. That's ours. Let's go get it. Let me ask you this question. What lens are you using? Are you using the lens that says, that obstacle in front of me is too big, I can't get to where God wants me to go because something's in my way? Are you using the lens that Caleb and Josh said that says this, that's mine, I'm gonna go get it because I know God's with me. And with God, nothing is impossible. 
Ephesians 3.20 reminds us that God is more than able to do anything. More than we can imagine. So as we go through this next song, put those lens on and see what God can do. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You do miracles. You are more than able. You are more.
Waymaker through. Let the waymaker through. We must decrease so he can increase. Father God, I turn this service over to you so that what you want to happen, your will is done right here this morning. Whether you're online or you're right here in this auditorium right now, God is coming through. Get out of this way. And I thank you for that, God. Because, Lord, you are more than able, more than I could ever imagine, Lord. And I'm so thankful for that, Lord. And as Pastor Jared's going to come up here this morning, Lord, I thank you for the word that you put on his heart, Lord, that's going to radically change somebody's life. Somebody came in broken is going to go out healed today, Lord. And I thank you for that. Lord, we love you. We love you because you loved us first. And Lord, I just pray over this service. I pray over every heart. I pray over whatever burden somebody brought in today, Lord, that they are released at your feet today. 
thank you, Jesus, for being present right here, right now. In your most precious name I pray, amen. Please take your seats and turn your attention to the screen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. It is good to be with you. Welcome to church. Welcome to One City Church. If this is your first time here, my name is Jared. I'm honored to have the opportunity to worship with you. Can I just say that's what we just did. We worshiped in this place. How many know there's nothing greater you can do for your life than worship the one who created you? Amen. God is good. God is good. God is good. Give him one more hand clap of praise. I want to make an announcement real quick before we get started with our message today. We're in this series called Influencers. I'm so excited to preach the word today. But before we get there, I want you to know something uh, really important. Well, two things. One is you might be wondering um, why she's in pink pajamas in the front. <laughs> and, and, and can I just say this? It's because right now in the back, it's our kids city uh, bedhead party. And I just need to say this. Our kid volunteers are going above and beyond for your children in the back. And so we just want to say thank you. Can we do this? If you serve in the kids, can you stand up real quick for us? Come on, give them a hand clap of praise for what they do every single week. We are so thankful for you. Thank you for everything that you do. Go ahead. You can be seated. Now, you know we have Easter coming up. March 31st. And we got those four services. We'll be at 830. 10, 1130 and one. Now, here's what you need to know about it. After Easter, we're going to stay in those four services. Right. And so we're going to come out of Easter and we're going to be right back into 830, 10, 1130 and one. So here's what you need to do. Get your mind right and pick the right service. And I want to just tell you this right now. Not only do we celebrate the, the way that God is expanding the kingdom here at One City Church and, and, and really throughout churches all across the country right now, but specifically uh, we had to make room in this particular service. And so now this service will, will move away from this time and you'll have once again either uh, 8.30, 10, 11.30 or 1 to choose from. Am I saying that right? 8.30, 10, 11.30 and 1. It would be crazy T if everyone just showed up the wrong time on Easter. Be my bad. Come on, who's ready for the word today? Influencers. Now, if you've been with us over this last week or so, last week we kicked off this series called Influencers. Influencers is all about what it means to become a disciple of Jesus. And so last week we opened up this series by looking at what it means to be an influencer in this world and how before I can influence anyone, I need to first evaluate who I'm allowing to influence me. How many know this? What I am is what I create. I'll say it this way. Who I am is who I recreate. And so if I'm healthy, what happens is I begin to attract healthy people. If I'm toxic, I begin to attract toxic people. And the person that I attract out of that attraction is who I will multiply. Can I just say this? We got enough toxic people in this world. And so the healthier I am, the healthier the people are that I attract, the healthier the people are that I reproduce, that I multiply. This is what we call discipleship in the church. And if that word disciple, if that's a new word to you, we defined it last week very simply. I'll give it to you now. A disciple is a learner who follows a master teacher. Y'all say follows follows a master teacher, meaning that when I get discipled, it's not about what I know, it's about how I live. The fruit of my life is so much more telling about who I am than the knowledge in my mind. And so for those who call Jesus their master, those who, who live a life of discipleship following Jesus, the call to discipleship is twofold. One, I leave behind everything I know. And two, I embrace a brand new life 
in Christ. Church, discipleship is about leaving behind, walking away from the things that hinder my relationship with God. I got to be willing to walk away from the things that hinder my joy, that hinder my peace, that hinder my purpose and embrace new life, including a new calling. And for some of us in this room today, a new purpose. You know, when we say that we are going to walk away from everything, sometimes that can be an overwhelming proposal for some people. But what did we say last week? That when it comes to Jesus, what you give up will pale in comparison to what you gain. You will give up dirt for what? Diamonds. And I want to take it even one step further. Because the truth of the transaction that happens in discipleship, the truth of me walking away from the things that get in the way of my relationship with God, when I walk away from those, I don't just gain diamonds. I gain something much more valuable. I gain Jesus. I get Jesus. And as we're going to discover today, I don't just receive him, but I receive an invitation from him. To allow my life to become more influenced by peace than it is by people. Can I just say this for some of us in this room right now? You're where you are today, not because you wanted to please God, but because you wanted to please people. And so today, for part two of our series, Influencers, I want to preach a message that I want to title today, You're Invited. You're invited. Look at the person on your left. Say you're invited. Now look at the person on your right. Say you're not. Yikes. Yikes. Didn't like that. (laughs) If you have a Bible today, (laughs) y'all are too easy. If you got a Bible today... We're going to be in the book of Matthew. You can open it up to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to be in verses 28 through 30. See, (laughs) the thing is, I can feel it right now. The people who were told they're not invited, you're feeling a little way right now. That was just a joke. Y'all can let that go because you need to walk. That's called discipleship, walking away from the old and into the new. Y'all are all invited. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 says this, starting with verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, we just welcome you into this place today. Father, we just pray that if anyone is in this place weary and burdened, that you would speak to them, that you would just give them the freedom to come into your full presence. Allow your word to resonate with us. Allow it to be transformational to us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Come on. So our passage begins with this invitation. And so we see an invitation from Jesus to his listeners to what? To come to him. Just like we saw last week in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus calls his first disciples. He calls out to Andrew and Peter, James and John, and he says, come, follow me. And so here we see another invitation to come into relationship with Jesus. And I can't emphasize this enough. The call to discipleship is invitational. It is an invitation. Why does it matter to you? Because someone needs to hear this. You cannot earn your way into the godly calling on your life. You have to become invited to it. See, some of us, we are spending all of our time trying to become someone worthy of doing something great. We're spending all of our time trying to become a version of ourselves that we think people will approve. And we are exhausting ourselves Becoming someone God never asked you to become. We're trying to become a version of ourselves 
that's not the true version of ourselves. And here's the thing. When I start to gain influence with people and I'm using an inauthentic version of myself, when the real me shows up, people leave. And here's the thing. We'll get offended and we'll say to people, they abandoned me. No, they didn't. They left the person that you gave them for the majority of the relationship. And then when the real you showed up, they didn't see the person they created a relationship with. They saw the person that you hid from them. In in all honesty, from their perspective, you're the one that got fake. Why? Because I gave my inauthentic self to them. Let's just be real. One of the greatest challenges in church is we have people coming in to to the authentic presence of God as an inauthentic version of themselves. And then we're trying to deal with the real problems in our life, the real challenges that we face day to day. The issue with that is that if only the inauthentic version of me shows up to church, which version's getting discipled? Not the one dealing with the problems, the one hiding them. And so we never get into a position to deal with the real challenges in our life. Why? Because I brought the fake me to church. Can I start with this question? Which version of you is here today? The real you or the fake you? So many of us, we spend our time with God developing a person that doesn't exist. (laughs) And then when all the people we're trying to impress leave us, It's not your fake self that's left alone. It's your real self. With real challenges, with real hardships. Church, if we're not careful, we will allow our fake self to have the influence and our real self just to have the brokenness. And we'll come to church not with the goal of getting healed or restored, but with the goal of just impressing people until I can go back into my brokenness at home. Can I just say that was never God's intention for your life? That when God calls out to his disciples and he says, come, follow me, he doesn't say, come, bring the fake version of you. Can I just tell someone sitting in these seats, God doesn't want the inauthentic version of you. He wants the real you. God did not design your life in trying to use you as a version of yourself that doesn't exist. He created you with purpose, with a calling. And until you get comfortable being you, you will not walk into that calling. You will not walk into that purpose. God's not into masks. He's into restoring his children. He's into restoring peace. He's into bringing joy. And today... He's inviting you to something better. And I want us to look at three invitations. Three invitations that Jesus calls us to, that our master calls us to, if we want to live the best life possible. And the first invitation is the invitation to follow him. The invitation to follow. You know, one of the most powerful things we can understand about Jesus is that he invites us to follow him. He doesn't demand it. You ever realize that? Like God, if he wanted to, he can make a very simple demand to say, you follow me or else. But what does he do? He calls out an invitation. This is the central theme of not only who Jesus is, but what Jesus' ministry is as well. It is an invitation. And so when Jesus says, come to me, all you, he's extending a hand. He's extending an invitation. He's extending an invite to to discipleship, to follow him, to be transformed by him, to find rest in him. It's an invitation to follow. How often are we following anything but Jesus and then just asking Jesus to fix it when it doesn't work out? 
It's an invitation to follow him. He says, come to me. And we must understand discipleship, it is not an invitation we extend to Jesus. It is an invitation Jesus extends to us. We don't get the luxury of trying other things and then going to Jesus when it doesn't work out. You know why? Because when it came to our sin, Jesus didn't try other things first. It's an invitation to follow. It's the nature of God. It's who God is. He, he extends an invitation to all people. Who? All people to follow him. But you have to understand he will not force you into that relationship. He will always let you choose. Why? Because he's a God of unconditional love. The moment that God forces you into action is the moment his love for you is no longer unconditional. It's conditional on that action. We say it all the time. Why do bad things in this world happen? Can I just say it? It might rub you the wrong way, but it's true. Because the people who are, who are doing the bad things, God loves them just as much as he loves you. In the same way he's not going to manipulate someone else's actions, he's not going to manipulate yours. It is a choice to follow him. That is unconditional love. And when I understand that God's love is unconditional, you know what else I understand, probably equally as important, is that because it's unconditional, it's available to everyone. Oh, you thought it was just for people who thought like you? Oh, you thought God was just for the people that agreed with where you stand in politics? Oh, you thought it was just for the people who live their life the way you live their life? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe I see Jesus say, come to me, all you who are righteous and holy. I don't think Jesus says, come to me, all you who are Republican or Democrat. I don't think he says, come to me, all you who live a lifestyle that doesn't make religious people comfortable. He says, come to, to me. Church, maybe, maybe it's about time we stop trying to fix other people's sin and we start worrying about our own. And then when we start worrying about our own, we turn to Jesus and we start loving people and we let Jesus do the fixing. We just do the loving. It's unconditional. It's for everyone. You know, one of the parables in the Bible that I love, it's not on the screen, but it's in Matthew 22. It's the parable of the wedding banquet. And, and in that parable, Jesus says this. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who throws a wedding banquet for his son. And the people that the king invites to the banquet, they refuse to come. And so the king goes to his servants and he tells them, go to the street corners and invite anyone you find. The church does not exist for you and people who look like you. It exists for everyone we can find. Everyone we can find who needs the presence of Jesus. Everyone we can find who's broken. Everyone we can find who hasn't had it figured out yet. Just because they don't think like you doesn't mean they're not loved by Jesus and you need to realize that. Because the faster you drop the expectation of how you want other people to live is the faster you get aligned with how Jesus wants you to love someone. It exists for everyone. People don't leave God. They leave people. One step further. People don't leave church. They leave people. And yet, Jesus invites everyone into his kingdom. Now, here's what we need to also understand. Jesus doesn't invite people to a place. He invites them to a person, to himself. Jesus never says, come to a place of worship. 
He doesn't call people to, to come to this style of worship. He doesn't say, come to this denomination or this kind of a church. He says, come to who? Me. Come to me. And maybe you're here today and you're church shopping. We're glad, you, we're glad you're here. <laughs> Welcome. There's a connect card in the front. <laughs> but let me also give you a bit of advice if you're church shopping here today. Stop looking for what you want and start looking for the presence of Jesus. Because if we're not careful, we will go around looking for what we want instead of receiving what we need. I don't need a situation that I like to find Jesus in. I need to start finding Jesus in the situations I don't like. I don't need to find a church that just tells me everything I want to hear, plays every kind of music I want. If you can't find Jesus in a song you don't like, you haven't connected to Jesus yet. That's the presence of God that we're after. You can't su suppress the authentic presence of God with a bad worship song. You can't, uh, you can't suppress the presence of God with a, with a message that you don't like. When you find the presence of God, you will stay clean to the presence of God. He gives us an invitation. And he says, all you who are weary and burdened. All of you who are weary. Do you know what that means? That means that no matter what you've walked through, no matter what you did today, no matter how broken you feel, no matter how worried or, or weary you feel, no matter how burdened you feel, when you walk into these doors, you are invited here. You are welcomed here. You are loved here. Jesus does not turn from you the moment you fall short. He says, I give you my grace, and out of my grace, I give you the opportunity to repent for your sins and make this relationship right. It's unconditional love. God's not looking for perfect people. In fact, Jesus calls to the weary and the burdened. He calls to me, he calls to you. He calls to the church who understand that he has something no one else can give us. This is the radical inclusivity of Jesus. Just because you haven't come to terms with how someone lives their life doesn't mean Jesus isn't still there for them. And don't get this twisted. Because in a, you can hear that and you can say, oh, see, I can live whatever life I want to live. No, not at all. What I'm saying is that if you get connected with Jesus, you'll live the life you're supposed to live. If you try living for me, it'll fall short. You try living for Jesus, whatever that correction is, it will be right for your life. Some of us, we're busier listening to people than we are to the presence of God. It's an invitation to follow him. Now, the second invitation that Jesus extends to us is not only an invitation to follow him, but also an invitation to rest in him. Hmm. So many of us are tired here today. Not because you lost an hour of sleep. Shut up. <laughs> that don't go with the sermon. That doesn't work in the sermon, so pretend that didn't happen. So many of us were exhausted here today. We're tired. You ever been to that point where no matter how much sleep you get, you still feel tired? You know why that happens? Because somewhere along the path of our life, we become more focused on pleasing people than pleasing God. And we start exhausting ourselves, trying to impress people instead of giving God the true needs of our life. And if we're just being transparent for most of us in the room, the question is not, are you weary? The question is, how weary are you? How tired are you really? How broken are you? How burdened are you from the striving, from the stressing, from the seeking of affirmation of man 
Instead of resting in the presence of God, church, how many know I find rest when I learn to stop trying to meet the expectations of people and I start resting in the presence of God? That is a rest no bed can give you. That is a rest no pillow can give you. That is a rest no other person can give you. Some of us, you need rest. The problem is you're seeking rest everywhere else but Jesus. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. You belong to him. You belong to, you know, uh, one verse before our main passage today. In verse 27 of Matthew 11, it says, all things have been committed to me by my father. All things have been committed to me by my father. Someone needs to understand this. You've been committed to Jesus. And when we look at that word committed in its root language, it says you've been surrendered to Jesus. You've been surrendered. Now, why is it so important to understand that? Because it is in surrender that I find the rest that my life truly needs. It is in the surrender that I find Jesus. It's in the surrender that I understand Jesus is my rest. Jesus is my portion. Jesus is my nourishment. Jesus gives me things no other person can give me. I just never get connected to him long enough to experience it. The sooner we understand who Jesus is in our life, the sooner we stop trying to replace him with things that can't give us what only he can give us. Come on, church. What are you trying to find rest in today? Who were you exhausting yourself trying to impress? What mask are you constantly wearing that at the end of the day you finally tear off and you sit down in your bed exhausted because you just lived a whole day as someone you were never designed to be? The grace of God says, I will give you rest. God doesn't say go earn your rest. He doesn't say go work harder for your rest. He doesn't say go find your rest someplace else where other broken people go. He says, I will give you rest. This is grace, church. This is the grace of God. And that is at the heart of Jesus' invitation to be discipled by him. I don't come to Jesus so that, so that I can earn something. I come so I can receive something. I come so that I can receive his grace, his love, his mercy, the blessings that only he can provide me. None of us deserve it, church. But he says, come to me. Someone in this room, you need to surrender the heaviness of your life to the only person who can carry it alongside you, and that's Jesus. You ever realize even some of the relationships in our lives, the relationships break and they fold under the pressure. And one of the reasons is, is because I gave that person something that was designed to be carried by Jesus, not that person. We're trying to find rest from our spouse. We're trying to find rest from our kids. We're trying to find rest from our bosses. When only Jesus can give it to us. I got to say it like like faith is not just some burden of life that I have to stuff into an overloaded life. If your faith feels like it's too hard to manage, you don't have faith. You have religion. Religion will weigh you down. Faith will lighten your life. And when I come into a relationship with Jesus, what that does is that takes the heaviness of my problems, the obstacles I can't deal with on my own, and it gives me a partner who I can walk alongside, who can actually do something about them. He says, yoke your life to me. Put your problems around my neck, and I will give you access to what you really need, a rest that you didn't even know existed. Oh, 
I just believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to someone. Because we as a culture, we as a society, we have normalized exhaustion. We have normalized stretching ourselves as thin as we can possibly get just to impress someone who has no power over your life. And that leads me to our third invitation, because not only do I receive an invitation to follow Jesus, not only do I receive an invitation to rest in him. But then it's my favorite one. And that's the invitation to a lighter life. An invitation to release the heaviness of your life. An invitation to exist without feeling like you have to impress everyone around you. An invitation to exist without feeling like you let everyone down or you can't measure up to the people that, uh, that are asking you to do things that you just don't have the capacity to do. You know, when Jesus says, take my yoke, He's actually making a metaphor that would have been so well understood to the audience of that time in that agricultural uh, society. When he says, take my yoke, a yoke was this long wooden beam. And what it would do is it would be placed on the necks of oxen or, or animals so that it would align them and they could pull the weight of something together. And so when Jesus says, take my yoke, you need to understand what he's doing is he's inviting you in to a life that aligns with his word. So that you are strengthened, so that you can share the burden, so that you can share in the mission and the purpose that Jesus has for your life. He says, come alongside of me. In the life that Jesus calls you to, it might not be free of challenges and it might not be free of hardships. But when I get aligned with Jesus, I am so much stronger than I was by myself. Take my yoke. For it's easy. My burden is, is light. Man, I, I don't know who needs to hear it, but, but I got to say it to you. You are not alone in your struggle. No matter how alone you feel today, no matter how much you feel like you have to hide from everyone around you because they might see the real you, no matter how you are here today, you're not alone. Jesus is willing to share your burdens. Jesus is willing to give you a strength to carry on and overcome the challenges that you face. You're not alone in your struggles. It's just you might have blocked out the only person who can help you. Jesus. You know, I love what Paul says, Galatians 6, 2. He says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. In other words, Paul says that, that the moment I can walk alongside someone and help them carry the problems of their life, I become most reflective of who Jesus is. When I carry the burdens of people, but I gotta say it. How can I help you carry your burden if all you ever do is hide it? Lean in, church. Anything you're gonna take away from today, take this. The longer you keep the real you hidden is the longer you keep the hurt you present. Think about that. The longer you remain unwilling to get authentic with God, to give him who you really are, not who you want people to see, the longer you keep the real you hidden, the longer you keep the hurt you present. One more time. The longer you keep the real you hidden, the longer you keep the hurt you present. You ever ask yourself, like, why can't I just shake this pain? Why can't I shake this feeling? 
And one of the hardest things I ever had to realize in my own life was because the person who was spiritually mature wasn't the real me. And it wasn't until I was able to strip off the weight of the mask, strip off the weight of expectation, strip off the weight that comes with all the labels that people place on you, regardless of position, regardless of title, to let that fall off and say, Jesus, here I am. Church, who's here today? The real you or the fake? Because when Jesus calls out and he says, come to me, come to me, he's not calling the fake version of you. He says, give me the real you. You don't have to be afraid. I already know you. Jesus already knows who you are. He already knows your brokenness. He already knows where you fall short. What he wants to know is, are you willing to give it to him? My burden is light. He says, my yoke is not filled with condemnation. It's not filled with shame or with guilt. It's filled with grace and love and freedom. Church, the yoke of Jesus is what aligns your heart to his heart. It's what aligns your life to his will. It's what aligns your forgiveness to the way he would forgive. It's what aligns how you love people to how he would love people. It is the yoke of Jesus that reflects him in you. <laughs> and the best part about the yoke of Jesus is that when I put it on, there's no way I can remain unchanged. The presence of God will always change you. Because when I come into the presence of God, the authentic presence of God with my authentic self, my vulnerabilities are exposed. My weaknesses are exposed. The things that need to come off of me are exposed. I just have to be willing to give it to him. I don't know about you, but I want to be molded by the yoke of Jesus, shaped by the yoke of Jesus, transformed by the yoke of Jesus. And the more yoked to him I get, the more closer to him I get. And how many know this? When I get into close proximity with someone, relationship with someone, I start to see the world they, in the way they see the world. I start to see people the way they see people. The closer to Christ I become, the more through his lens I see this world. Not as the fake me, but as the real me. Come on, who's here today? The real you or the fake you? And if the real you shows up, you are gonna discover that the yoke of Jesus fits perfectly upon your neck. And he is ready to walk alongside of you in your challenges, in your burdens, in your hardships, no matter what that looks like. Because he's the good shepherd. And he knows his flock. Do you know what that means? It means that he knows you. It means he knows what you need. It means he knows what you lack. And he knows what it's going to take for you to live a transformed life. John says it, John 10, 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
Church, I think sometimes we forget that Jesus traded his life for yours. That he came alongside of you. He put your sins on his back. He nailed them to a cross so that you wouldn't have to live a life of brokenness. So that you wouldn't have to live a life of guilt or live a life of shame. Jesus already did the hard work. You need to start walking free in it. Jesus already handled your sin. Jesus already paid for your sin. Jesus already paid for your brokenness. Now you can walk in the restoration that only comes from following him, from resting in him, and from living a life that is aligned to the word of God. Because it is the word of God that will become transformational to your life. And hear me when I say it. Transformation is not you becoming the best version of you. Transformation is you becoming a little more like Jesus. It's not about what you can do. It's about what can he do through you. And he says, here's how you do it. Three steps. Say yes to the invitation to follow me. Say yes to the invitation to rest in me. And say yes to the invitation to align your life with my words. And out of that alignment, transformation comes. And you start to pray, but you pray different. And you start to read the Word of God, but now you read it different. And you start to serve your church, but now you serve it differently. And now you forgive people in ways you can never forgive people. You love people in ways you can never love people. Why? Because you're not the best version of you. You're just a little more like Jesus. Through the good times, through the bad times, I will remain steadfast in my faith. clinging to the one that I follow, the one I find rest in, and the one who leads me to a life that is influential in the way he designed it, not the way I designed it. Come on, would you pray with me today? Jesus, we thank you for your presence here today. Father, today we just ask that you would help us to remember that that you do more with us in our brokenness than we could ever do in our wholeness. And so Jesus, today we just surrender our burdens to you. We surrender our challenges and our hardships to you. Father, today we pray for the courage to step into our authentic selves, to step into who you truly created us to be, so that we can encounter our true purpose that you've designed for us. And maybe you're in this place today and maybe you've realized it's been a fake version of you coming to church for a very long time. And and I don't know who needs to hear this line, but I need to say it that You can come to church your whole life and the real you can never show up once. And if that's you, and maybe the reason you've hidden your true self is a fear of rejection. Maybe you don't want to be disapproved by people. Maybe you're worried that the person you're married to won't approve. Maybe you're worried that the people you work for won't approve. Maybe you're worried about the people in your small group won't approve. And if that's you today, I just feel the Holy Spirit saying you need to have permission to be who God created you to be. And if you're in this place and you had the revelation that the real you hasn't shown up yet. And you want the real you to start a relationship with Jesus. We call that a recommitment of our faith. And if today you're ready to make a recommitment, or maybe it's your first time making the commitment to follow Jesus, to find rest in Jesus, and to align your life with him. If you want to start that process, then on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. I believe Jesus is is speaking to people. I believe that there's someone in this room who is going to finally be comfortable to be who they are so that Jesus can begin to work on the real problems of your life. 
not the fake problems that you just want other people to see don't exist and if that's you and you want to give your life to Christ today the real you then on the count of three I want you to raise your hand with all heads bowed all eyes closed I believe Jesus is speaking to people on the count of three one two three raise your hand come on raise your hand come on yeah praise Jesus praise Jesus we see you we see you come on give the Lord a hand clap of praise the kingdom of heaven is growing the kingdom of heaven is growing and if you raise your hand if you raise your hand today I want you to know that you're sitting in a community of people that is okay with who you are today but I also want you to know this just like Jesus we're gonna love you enough to not let you stay there <laughs> and if you raise your hand we want to pray with you today but at one city no one's ever gonna pray alone so let's all pray this prayer together say dear God I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior I believe you sent your son Jesus to take my place on the cross to die to be buried and to rise again so my relationship with you can be restored I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord therefore I'm saved I'm a child of God and everyone said amen and amen and amen come on give the Lord a hand clap of praise God is good God is good Thank you so much for being here with us at One City. We're so glad that you are here with us today. My name is Lisa, and this is my friend Stephanie, and we are your Connections hosts for today. Good morning, One City. Uh, we're excited for you to be here today. Um, if you're a first-time guest, there is a Connect card um, in front of you. If you're in the front, it's behind you. Uh, this card is the best way to uh, stay in touch with the things that are happening in One City. Uh, this card also represents uh, food, shelter, and clothing that we um, are with Pins Ministries. And also, we, when you fill it out, you can put it in the bins behind in the back of the auditorium or give it to the ladies at the tent and you will receive a, a gift for just, just for being with us today. So we appreciate you. And don't forget March 31st is Easter at One City. So we have four services. They will be at 8.30, 10, 11.30, and 1. So if you have any friends, family, tell them to come. We will be having Easter um, here at One City. So thank Yes. You. Amen. And I get the privilege to pray over our offerings. So now we're going to talk about our tithing. If you have partnered with us financially at One City, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you saw highlights on uh, social media this week of the teens house party that was here, the youth house party this week. There were a lot of students here that were getting loved on by our youth team and hearing about Jesus. And that is made possible because of your giving. The bedhead party that's going on in the back right now, that's made possible by your giving. And this is the next generation of our church. So we thank you so much for your generosity and for your obedience to the Lord. There are many ways to give. If you have cash or check, you can get one of the envelopes in the seat back pockets, slide it in there, put it in one of the giving boxes on the way out. And all of our many ways to give digitally are behind me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for um, your promise to us that you will take our gifts and multiply them. God, we thank you for um, the ways that your kingdom is being furthered here at One City. We thank you for those who um, have followed you in obedience to giving, and we ask that uh, you bless them also. And thank you so much for every person that gives in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.